Hi guys, welcome back to We Should Talk, a pop culture interview series from In The Know. I'm your host, Gibson Johns, and today on the podcast, we have Cameron Rogers, who you may know as the Freckled Foodie or the host of Freckled Foodie and Friends podcast. She has spent years building up a huge community on social media based around her food content, recipes, cooking content, restaurant recommendations, all things food. She lived in the West Village, um, but over the past several years, she's become a mother. She's currently very pregnant with her second child, and by the time this interview comes out, she actually might have already given birth to her second child, um, so it was really great that she had time to sit for this interview. Um, she used to be an in the know contributor. She wrote articles for us. We featured her in a dinner party series. She's really great. She's a friend of the brand. And um, so it was fun to get some really in depth time with her to talk about her content, her brand, um, all things motherhood, whether what kind of how the second pregnancy has been different from the first and what her audience expects from her, what it was like, you know, expanding the breadth of her content. You know, it really was just food for so long. And now it's it really is mostly about pregnancy and motherhood and, and food is kind of intertwined into all of that, but it's not her focus anymore, or at least for right now. Um, she's she's so great she's so open she's so authentic and just like there's no artifice with her and it, she's really fun to talk to and we ended the conversation talking about um this topic that's come up recently because of a big article in the cut where it talked about how um when babies enter the mix how friendships are how friendships change so in one side of a friendship as a baby how does that friendship change? How does it survive? How does it, how did things, you know, move forward? And she had a lot of thoughts on that topic. She's already spoken publicly about it. And so she, I loved hearing her thoughts on it. Very interesting, especially coming from her, her perspective. I don't have children and she does. Um, so yeah, it was, a, it was a fantastic conversation. So keep listening for my interview with Cameron Rogers. Follow her on social media. Check out her podcast, Freckled Foodie and Friends podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. And please rate, review, and subscribe to We Should Talk. Thanks, guys. All right, so we are here with Cameron Rogers, who you may know as Freckled Foodie, the host of Freckled Foodie and Friends podcast. She's also a former In the Know contributor. We feature her in one of our series before. So she is a friend of In the Know, and I'm so excited to have her here for an in-depth conversation. Cameron, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm great. You know, you have you have way more going on than I do. So <laughs> <laughs> I, there, there's a lot happening over here. We're like two weeks out. Or two weeks. Summer. Yeah. It's, it's, it's go time. Wow. Wow. And you, you move, you're not in Manhattan anymore. You're not in the West Village anymore. No. You moved. We moved out to Jersey, um, nine months ago, like literally three weeks before I got pregnant. So we've been here for a bit. I would say we feel settled, but having gotten pregnant, right after do. we moved, it kind of like took a back seat because it was just survival mode of my first trimester slash second trimester. But yeah, we moved. I love it. But I'm still in the city all the time. I'm there like once a week. Mm -hmm. How is how has both though like just being based in Jersey and not in the city? How is that? I mean, that that's I just can't even I as somebody who lives in the East Village, I can't really wrap my mind around that lifestyle alone, much less like being a parent. So like how has just not being located in the city affected your life? Okay. I, everyone says that when people leave the city, they're so annoyingly haters of the city. And I don't want to come off like that because I still love New York. But, but. this, <laughs> but what I always knew, to be fair, I always knew I didn't want to raise children in New York. Right. Like I knew I wanted to raise them in a more suburban area with a yard and just access to those types of things. It's, it's, really hard and expensive to raise kids in Manhattan. Oh my God. And I loved having a baby in Manhattan. And then once he became a toddler, it became a little bit more confusing. It was also COVID. So like our lives shifted from a work from home standpoint, all of that. And since moving, I mean, I just feel generally so much calmer. And I was having this conversation with my friend who commutes in every day, where when I'm in New York, I am so much more like aware and alert than right. I ever was when I lived there and I texted my husband the other night I had spent the day there for work and then had a dinner and I was like can you believe people just live in New York like they, they just live here and he's like we lived there for 10 years what do you mean I'm like I can't explain it but when I'm there I almost look around and I forget that when I left everyone else didn't also leave do you know what I mean? No, totally. And I think, and I think there's like an element of living in New York that's like just by pro like just like by nature of living there, you put up with so much in your daily life that so you much. don't realize that you're putting up with just 
to live there. You know, it's yeah. like you, you have to get pulled out of that bubble to just even recognize some of those things. Yeah. I also think it's been confusing for me because every time I've gone back since we moved, I've been pregnant. So in the beginning, I was just like nauseous the whole time. The scent of things was really killing oh, that's me. Triggering, and then yeah. towards the end, I've been extremely pregnant and it was the summer. So I'm just like the heat, I can't. So I'm excited for going back to visit and right. all of that fun stuff, not in pregnancy, but it's just... I mean, everyone knows it's calmer outside of New York. So right. there is that just slower mindset that feels very nice for a anxiously wired human. And, and a, a, a soon to be mother of two. So that there, there's a, there's enough pace happening within your house yes. probably that you're like, okay, I need, I, I need some balance here. Right. And like simply being able to just step outside my door and like touch grass is magical. Oh, I'm sure. I, I can't relate, but I'm sure it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Second pregnancy. What is like, what has this second one? How is it compared to your, your first go around? Because you're preparing to be a mother too, versus preparing to be a mother for the first time, which I'm suspecting is a very different mindset and experience. So yeah. talk me through a little bit of, of how that, what that's been like for you. I feel like my first pregnancy was very anxiety inducing because there was so much unknown both in the pregnancy and for what was to come. Right. So I was anxious around just the being of pregnant and the confusion around all the symptoms I was having, yeah. what was happening to my body. And it was all so new. And I was so terrified for what was about to happen of just like, a, how is this baby going to fit out of my vagina? But B, what, how do I breastfeed? How do I know when to feed? How do we change that? Like all of it. And I remember leaving the hospital being like, so, so we just were in charge of this thing. Like, you're just going to let us go with no guide. Like they don't send you home with anything to right. be like, this is how you keep a human alive. You do your own home. You, you find your own homework to do. I'm sure. Yeah. And it was just my husband and I and our baby in our apartment. So it was very just like we learned as we went kind of thing. And this time around, I feel mentally, I wasn't anxious. I actually felt more depressive this pregnancy. I feel better now. But in the beginning, I was really struggling. And I honestly just think when you're pregnant for the first time, there's so much focus on the pregnancy because Again, it's all you can think about. And this time around, I'm caring for a toddler. Right. And I, not that I ever forget I'm pregnant, but I just, it, it, it's so backseat kind of, and not in any bad way. It's just the reality. And I keep saying to my husband, like, we finally just started really setting everything up because everyone would ask. And I'm like, oh, we have everything. And then finally I was like, do we? Where is everything? <laughs> like, I keep saying we have all this stuff, but I have no concept of where it is. And even I went through our son's old clothes because I said we didn't need any new clothes. And somehow we only had like five onesies, zero to three months. <laughs> I'm like, where did they all go? I have no idea, but I guess we do need to get some stuff. Right. Loss of the move maybe, but no, totally. It's, yeah. It sounds like it's like simultaneously more relaxed, but also there's sort of like a, I don't know, not, not a last yeah. minute, what like, like kind of freak out, but like a, I think it's just, it's so much more relaxed, even yeah. just the doctor's appointments. My husband came to every single doctor's appointment okay. with me the first time around, every single one. This time I think he came to one scan <laughs> and I'm just like, oh yeah, I'm going to the doctor. He's like, but, okay. Um, but it, it's more relaxed. And I also think it might be a little bit more of a, wow, we actually have a child moment when the baby comes. Yeah. Right. Right. Totally. And it's interesting because I always knew you as someone to go, go to for like accessible, healthy recipes, cooking tips, restaurant recommendations, all that, like really food only. Like that was your thing for so long. Yeah. And, and you grew such an amazing platform, like on the back of that. And people loved that from you, but it seems as though in recent years, I, I'm guessing since becoming a mother, you really leaned, you kind of just, you broadened your, the, the yeah. kind of the breadth of your content and to really be more inclusive of like really focusing on motherhood and mental health and, and wellness generally, which obviously all kind of can relate back to food in different ways and food fits right into that. But talk me through, cause I'm assuming it was a pretty conscious decision for you to like, again, broaden that, that breadth of content. Talk me through that, that mindset when you're like, okay, I'm so known for one thing. Can I fit everything else in or can, can, will people still want all this stuff, other stuff from yeah. me? 
I was just having this conversation with my friend because I am a big believer personally in you have to show up as yourself and share what you're passionate about to create any type of platform or community. And so when I first started my account, I was working in a corporate world. I was meal prepping. I was planning out meals. I was packing lunches for my office. Like that was my life. Right. And that was the content I was creating. And it was resonating with the community because they were potentially in that same stratosphere of their life. As I started to then leave the corporate world and then deal with my own mental health stuff and start sharing more publicly and connect with my community outside of food, I personally felt a more of a connection with my community in those conversations. Like people messaging me saying that they saw a therapist for the first time because I was so open about therapy or felt less alone because I shared X, Y, Z meant more to me personally than them saying they made one of my recipes. And I also just felt a deeper connection and I felt more lit up by sharing that type of stuff. Simultaneously, when I got pregnant, A, just food like disgusted me. So it was just kind of a backseat to begin with. But B, I was so engrossed in this pregnancy of like, what is happening? This is wild. And sharing that. And I started to build either a new community or build on top of the community I had. And with that, yes, have I, I'm sure lost people because they don't resonate with my content anymore. Right. Absolutely. And I totally understand that there's no bad blood or hard feelings. Simultaneously, it's been really fun for members of my community to evolve with me and grow with me because maybe they're in the same stages of their life. And then on top of that, connect with new people who have found me in the motherhood stratosphere. So because I feel very strongly about showing up authentically as myself, it wouldn't make sense for me to be posting like meal prep and office lunch, because that's just not my reality. Mm -hmm. How I've integrated food back into my platform now that I'm interested in it on this end of my pregnancy and will be postpartum is from the lens of now what my life is of like, how do I put dinner on the table table that my kid will eat? Or like this whole new world of what am I packing my toddler for lunch to bring to school? Stuff that never once was relevant in my life five years ago, but Mm -hmm. now is really where my brain goes when it comes to food. Right. No, it makes total sense. And I'm curious, was there an element, was there another element of it being like, you were focused on one thing for so long. Is there any sort of burnout that happened from focusing on one really specific area of content or, or, I mean, it's obviously a natural passion for you, but I'm just, yeah. was it, was it like refreshing for you to like not have to focus on that one thing exclusively? I go back and forth on that. And I don't know if it was burnout, but it was more so when I was so hyper-focused on food, I also think I was personally struggling with my own eating habits, which I think Mm -hmm. is very common in this industry. And food became less of a focus for me mentally, where it just took up less brain space. Now it takes up a lot of brain space in the sense of just planning meals for people outside of my own body. But it used to be this obsession of ingredients and every meal had to be perfect. Mm -hmm. And those types of emotions where now I'm like, I literally have no concept of what I'm eating for lunch. I'll open the fridge and see what I can possibly scavenge a meal out of. So there's that. And then there's also a feeling of sometimes I'm like, God, it was so nice when I was focused on food because I could batch content and right. really like take the lens off of myself and not feel pressure to have content recorded of me doing stuff that like I'm just going about my life but then I'm also on the flip side like sometimes it's really nice to be able to just pull up my phone and talk about whatever I want to talk about and share whatever I'm experiencing and not have to worry about the grocery shopping the lighting the filming the editing so I go back and forth on it Mm -hmm. and you you get deeper into a lot of a lot of these topics for yourself on your podcast freckle foodie and friends mm-hmm. and you you really go deep and you get you're very vulnerable you you get you can get emotional you get really deep about certain things and you just mentioned or alluded to like a pressure to to share things what's your yeah. balance of what cuz obviously your community wants to be let into your life and your and what you're thinking about and what you're feeling but what's your balance of what you're sharing and what you're keeping private so for me i never feel I will never share anything because I feel pressured to share it. Good. So it's where is it coming from inherently? 
as a human, I don't have many filters. So I feel very confident and comfortable just like laying it all out there in my real life. When I'm talking with people I just meet or friends or whatever, Mm -hmm. I'm just kind of saying what's coming to me. My one real boundary that I've worked on over the years is I feel comfortable sharing my own story, but that does not include my family, my husband, my children. Like this is not their platform. So I feel free to share and be vulnerable about things I'm experiencing, but I absolutely set boundaries, especially around my family, because even with our children, you know, I talk about this in my platform a lot, but I actively don't share our child. I've since even switched going back to like a pseudo nickname for him on the internet. And there are things that are his experience that impact me and take up a lot of my brain space and are things that I'm anxious over or worrying about or whatever, but I'm still choosing not to share those because it boils down to his experience. Right. And so walking that line can be confusing as a content creator who I'm sure. is quote unquote, like a motherhood stuff. And, you know, the not sharing my kid takes away a lot of content, takes away a ton of brand opportunities and all of that, but it's something that I would always rather be on that side of personally. So that was a decision that I made early on and have stuck to. But I think the bottom line with boundaries is at the end of the day, is it my story? And if it's not, then it doesn't need to be shared. Got it. Yeah. And it, and is that, is being on that side of it and t- making that decision early on, is that partially of like, okay, when he gets to a certain age where he could Google you or, or see what you put online over the past, yeah. I don't know, eight years, like, is that, it was that part of it? Like thinking about that moment when it comes? So it's, it's so multi-layered. Yeah. One, it's a people on the internet terrify me. So like, who knows <laughs> of course. Who are doing these images? Yep. Like it's Scary. really yeah. terrifying. If you look at like the saves on TikTok videos of kids, if they're in a bathing suit or doing something, Ooh. it's astronomically higher. So really? like, wow. Yeah, it's, it's horrifying. Ugh. So there's that aspect of like actual creeps. I don't even mean trolls. I mean like terrifying humans. Like dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. Danger. Um, so that's one of the things. The second part being like, he didn't sign up for this. Exactly. And I feel, you know, I've ha- I have these conversations with all of my family members, all of my friends. If I'm going on a bachelorette trip, it's the first question I ask people like, hey, whether I just met you or you're my best friends in second grade, what am I able to share this weekend? What are you comfortable with? What are you not? If you don't want to be on any content, just tell me. And a hundred percent, I respect that. And people are very open about like, share you can post me but like just don't do don't share anything if I'm drunk you know maybe my yeah. colleagues fine because at the end of the day no one else is signing up for this so I think about it in that sense of my kid like he he's not signing up to have his whole life online and yeah the the searching his name when he's older or that kind of stuff or even just like the images all of those things for me what I will say I never actively thought about but has been the greatest gift is that it allows me to be present as a mother because I'm never thinking about content when I'm with him. If I had opened that floodgate of like, I'm going to share him and I'll post videos of him. I feel I wouldn't be able to be present in those moments because I'd also be thinking, oh, sh- should I be right, recording exactly. this? This would make a good reel. This would make it There's great no job. line. There's no, there's no right. division. Which is so sad, but yeah. like the reality as a creator, that's what would happen. And it's so wonderful for me to, yes, I'll put my phone up every once in a while to record. So I have the videos or to send them to our family or my husband, if he's not there, but there's no working brain aspect of like, this is content because it's already off the table, which is such a gift personally. Right. right. Totally. And, and, you know, another aspect of, of being so open with people on the, on the internet and you alluded to, I think some of the, the feedback that can come in, I think, you know, regardless of what kind of creator you are, you're going to get negative feedback. You're going to get unsolicited yeah. advice and all that. But I feel like when you're sharing content around pregnancy and motherhood, the the level of like unsolicited feedback and criticism wow. and advice is probably just like another level. What has your experience been with like with that? And how do you either just push it out completely or like, cause I'm sure, I'm sure sometimes people do have just like generally pretty good advice or like tips or whatever, but like, so how do you, what's that kind of, yeah. um, how do you sort through that? So it's twofold. There's like the unsolicited advice and then there's the trolling. Yeah, the of course. unsolicited advice 
sometimes can be helpful. And sometimes I'll, I'll be the first person to ask my community for things. Like for yeah. instance, I was trying to get access to a vaccination that just came out recently and I could not figure out where people were getting the shot. So I put up a box, like a question box. I'm like, guys, where or how are you doing this? How are you making it work? And that's then I got an answer and I was able to go get right. and get the vaccine and I shared, et cetera. So I will be the first person or like, what are you guys doing for a double stroller? You know, because I do have this incredibly engaged and pool of humans who might have the answer. So I do lean on them for moments but i am also there are times where i'll post a story and be like i'm actually not asking for feedback <laughs> and i try to get ahead of it because the dms can overwhelm oh me oh my god i'm sure and then you know sometimes the, they're still going to come in and i can just be like oh thanks i already decided and sometimes quite honestly then they give me an option i'm like oh wait a second that makes a lot more sense so <laughs> it, it, it's more it's just, pro yeah. than con, in my opinion, from what I've experienced, but I get how it can go the other way. The trolling will forever fascinate me because I just can't imagine being so worked up around like the way someone else parents, so long as the kid is like being cared for. And what it has, what's been interesting to me is becoming a mom has untapped a whole new level of like, I truly don't give a f right. because what some stranger who's sitting behind a keyboard thinks about me no longer matters when I know that I am truly God's gift to earth to this child. And I like created him and I'm responsible for him. And I am his everything. I'm like, I don't care. what do you think of me? I don't care. This the, pers the perspective that you've gotten is just so, right. so much greater. Yeah. So when it comes to the like mom trolling, I feel so confident personally in my role as a mother that it really does not get to me because <laughs> good like, that's amazing that's you like you can think whatever you want I mean and talk um, about like I mean that that to me is like tells you that you have some really great tools like mental health tools because like that not everybody can say that that they can deal with that that easily I mean honestly but you also have to like put the blinders on I'm not looking for the information I'm yeah. like I, you know I'm sure people have their own opinions of me <laughs> and that's their own to deal with but I know that I'm doing my best job. And I know that my son feels so eternally loved and cared for. And at the end of the day, that is all that matters to me. Yeah. And you probably avoid a good amount of that because you don't show your son, which is probably, yeah. that is probably, that's- a, a That's the situation. other thing I put, like, I'm very good at not engaging. I've stopped. I've just, nothing ever good comes from it, et cetera. If someone came after my child, like I could, the the anger and the, stuff that I would do so I'm just taking it off the table totally like, I don't to go down that thing. road exactly take it not yeah. not a possibility um it's interesting because there's been a couple articles recently I think it was all based on maybe like one big New York Times article or something about like you know how when you become a mother or your friends become mothers oh, the and, friendship. yeah and how it affects your friendships and I think it's such an interesting topic because I'm not yet at the point where many of my friends are having children but they're definitely getting married and engaged in that obviously affects friendships as well. And I'm curious if you had any thoughts on that topic and how becoming a mother and you're about to become a mother of two, how that's affected your friendships and how you've kind of dealt with some of those hurdles. I have so many thoughts. So it was the cut article that was in your yes, magazine. It yes. was like, why can't our friendship survive your child or something along the lines Yeah, of you're that. right. Yeah, that's it. Um, and I did a whole story series and then TikTok on my reaction because I felt so, I feel so passionately about this topic. And I had started a series within my podcast called like the friendship series, because I get so many questions on this or how to make friends or how to maintain friendships because my girlfriends are truly the greatest gift to me. Like I really deeply care about my friendships. And I think as a creator, there are a lot of times or as a consumer, there are a lot of times where you see creators only hanging out with other creators. And I have a few creator friends that I'm close with, but for the most part, I'm spending time with the people who have been in my life for, for years. Time. Yeah. So I get a lot of questions on this and I started a series on my show. And the first episode was with one of my girlfriends who does not have kids and how we navigated postpartum because it's a really confusing time for the person who just gave birth 
there is so much happening. Their life has been turned upside down, especially the first time around. Mm -hmm. And for someone who has not experienced it, you truly cannot fathom it until you've lived it. And I remember going through it and texting some of my girlfriends who had kids before me being like, wow, I was not there for you during your Mm -hmm. postpartum because I simply had no idea. So I think on the person who just gave birth, you have to have some grace with your friends who haven't had kids because they don't, understand exactly what's happening and they can't until they potentially experience it one day but I also think that there are ways to have these conversations ahead of time or during postpartum that can set you guys up as friends to better succeed and so that's what I'm really trying to do with the content around this topic and Mm -hmm. I've been so honored by the like response of being like this helped me so much show up for a friend in a better way because it's really about communication and everyone's going to be different but it's the first time that the friendship is really one-sided I think friendships are kind of like a seesaw someone's always going to need a little bit more or have to give a little bit more but this is the first time where it's really like someone is sitting down like three times heavier than the other person on the seesaw and it is one way and as the person who did not give birth, I think you have to like understand that and remember that this isn't permanent, but you're going to have to be the one that gives more for the time being. And as the kids get older, I think something that bothered me about the article a little bit was just so much could have been cleared up through communication. Like as the person who had a kid, I have to understand that my friends without kids are not going to care about my son's sleep schedule or his diapers or schooling or any of those things. Yes, mm-hmm. of course, like I'll send them updates on his life and photos, but like no one's going to love my kid as much as me. And you have to understand that. And there are relationships for different things. And I don't mean that in a mean way. It's my friend who is a kid the same age as me is someone I'm going to be texting 24 seven all day long. Like, oh my god tantrum city what (laughs) cup are you using jesus christ these toddlers are crazy like that type of conversation and my friend without kids is going to be focused more on non-child conversation with the once in a while update and i also think it's really important as the parent with children to remember that like their emotions are valid too if they're if they're struggling with something or they complain about something I hate the like oh just wait or you know your problems oh well I have a kid that didn't sleep like that drives me insane when we invalidate those emotions because before we had kids those things bothered us too like right and that friend might never have a kid that 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 friend might just never want to be a a mother too you know it's like are her problems always going to be less valid like no that's not the case no. And that makes me so angry. So I, I really actively try never to do that. Yeah, and also you have to celebrate wins for people, not only outside of kids, but outside of engagements and marriages and that kind of stuff, because your friends might not want that and find ways to celebrate them. Like one of my girlfriends that kids got a really exciting new job. And so I sent her flowers. Cause I'm like, that's a huge yeah, win. Of course. Like, that's the biggest thing that's happening in your life right now. Let's celebrate it. So mm. I think showing up, on both sides and communicating is so important. Right. And I feel like it It seemed like the, the article resonated partially so much because it was, it's one of those topics that's sort of like whispered about, or you, t- you might talk about it like outside of a group chat or like X, Y, Z. Like it's not something that's ever really been broadcast on like a pretty big level, I think. And that's probably why your content around it is resonating so much with people because like it hasn't been talked about that much, at least that from what I've seen, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I think people are always afraid to broach the subject because as a creator, for instance, if I got on here and was like, my best friend was a bitch during postpartum, like no one's going to do that. Right. And that I think was why the first episode of the series was so great because it was one of my closest friends and we got on. And luckily we had had this honest conversation on our own many mm-hmm. months, years ago, but we were like, let's talk through why we struggled during my postpartum and how we worked through that and what the conversation looked like. It's so helpful. That's so helpful. And it, it's, I'm curious to see what else. I mean, that's only a topic you can keep going down and I'm sure totally. again, ha- having another child will probably impact that or sh- kind of shift some of those things even more for you. So I'm, I think that's a really great kind of road to be going down for people to hear from you about. Yeah. 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 I agree. Yeah. Um, well, Cameron, I think that's all the time we have, but this has been so much fun and I'm so, so fun. I'm so excited for you. We're thank you. P- potentially less than two weeks out, two weeks after the due date. Like the bag it's, is packed. We're ready. Such an exciting time and um, just soak it all in. And um, everyone is so happy for you, I'm sure. And 
you know, this is, it's just been, again, Thanks. continue to continue to share your life because you're clearly helping a lot of people also by, by opening up. Thank so. you so much. Yeah, you're of course. So is, there, really is there anything, you. is there anything you'd like to plug before we uh, sign off? No, I mean, I'll just say you can come join the FF fam over on Instagram or TikTok. It's at Cameron Nooks Rogers and the podcast you mentioned, Freckled Foodie and Friends. We release a new episode every Wednesday and we worked our butts off for the past like six months to make sure that there will be an episode you releasing did. Wow! every week during maternity leave. So we are ready to go. That's incredible. Oh my God. That's yeah, a lot of work. love it. Um, all right. Well, Cameron, this has been so much fun. Um, again, so happy for you and we'll talk soon. Thank you. Bye. Yep. Thanks for tuning in to We Should Talk. I hope you enjoyed the interview. You can find out more about In The Know at inthenow.com. You can follow me, Gibson John, at Gibsonoma on Twitter and Instagram. And you can listen to all of our interviews, past and future, by searching We Should Talk wherever you get your podcasts. Hope to see you next time.